911. Do you need police fire medical? My daughter's dead. She just had to go in there. So did she hang herself? No, she didn't hang herself, but the... How old is she? Her. So, huh, she's uh, 11 years old. Keep breathing? Uh, no, she's dead. The haunting recording you've just heard is the 911 call placed by 37-year-old Billy Cope upon discovering his daughter, Amanda, lifeless in her bedroom. In the early hours of November 29, 2001, in Rock Hill, South Carolina, Billy Cope jolted awake around 3 a.m., a gnawing sense of unease gripping him. Instantly, he sensed an anomaly within his home. The hallway light was inexplicably switched on, despite his clear memory of turning it off before retiring to bed. With his wife, Mary Sue, absent at her overnight janitorial job, it was just Billy and his three daughters, Amanda, the eldest at 12, alongside Jessica and Kyla, aged 11 and 7, respectively. A deeply religious family, they had forgone their usual Wednesday church service that night due to Jessica's struggles with math homework, requiring additional assistance to complete her assignment. Ever the caring elder sibling, Amanda had generously offered her aid, prompting Billy to agree to allow the girls to stay up until the task was accomplished. Kyla, the youngest daughter, had retired to bed at 9 p.m. while Billy remained up until 1 a.m., diligently aiding his daughters with their studies. Following the completion of their schoolwork, they had all retired to bed, with Billy activating his CPAP breathing machine, a remedy for his sleep apnea, before succumbing to slumber. Strangely, just two hours later, he was abruptly roused from his sleep. Still groggy, Billy shuffled towards his daughter's rooms to investigate. Amanda's door stood closed, leading him to speculate that she might have been the one to illuminate the hallway. Perhaps she had stirred for a drink of water during the night. Peering into the other bedroom, he found solace in the sight of his younger girls peacefully asleep in their beds, their innocence undisturbed. Content with his cursory inspection, he returned to his own bed, reattaching his breathing apparatus before drifting back into slumber. The following morning, at 6 a.m., Billy was roused by the blaring of his alarm clock. Reflecting on those fleeting moments of rest, he recounted dreams of the rapture, wherein Jesus descended to claim his faithful. In the vision, he witnessed Amanda ascending while he remained behind, her departing words, Bye, Daddy, echoing in his mind upon awakening. Still reeling from the intensity of his dream, Billy hastily abandoned his bed to check on his daughters. Relief washed over him as he observed his younger girls still peacefully slumbering. Yet, his sense of calm was fleeting. Struggling to open Amanda's door, he found it snagged on the closet door ajar behind it. With a surge of urgency, he exerted force to breach the barrier, only to be met with an unbearable sight. Amanda's lifeless form lay inert upon her bed. As he reached out to touch her, a chill enveloped him, confirming his worst fears. In a daze of shock, he covered her and, grappling with disbelief, dialed 911. 911, do you need police fire medical? My daughter's dead. She just had to go in there. So did she hang herself? No, she didn't hang herself, but the... How old is she? Her. So, huh, she's uh, 11 years old. Keep breathing? Uh, no, she's dead. Within minutes, paramedics from the Rock Hill Fire Department descended upon the scene, their life-saving equipment rendered futile in the face of Amanda's tragic passing. Jason Dillon, representing the fire department, queried Billy about his perception of events, to which Billy speculated that Amanda might have succumbed to an accident involving her blanket, citing her tendency to roll in her sleep. However, the arrival of detectives swiftly shifted the tone as they perceived Billy's composed demeanor as suspicious, noting his apparent lack of emotional display. The detectives promptly cordoned off the premises, designating it an active crime scene, and commenced a thorough investigation. The house, engulfed in disarray, 
presented a formidable challenge to the investigators, with clutter strewn across every room. Clothes piled high, dishes teetering on the brink of overflow, and insects scuttling into the shadows. Amidst this chaos lay Amanda's lifeless form, adorned in her garments, surrounded by mementos of her youth, books and freshly acquired school portraits, imbuing the scene with an eerie poignancy. Upon examination, Investigators made the grim discovery that Amanda had been subjected to a brutal assault, bearing evidence of both physical trauma and strangulation as the causes of her untimely demise. Bruises marred her body, serving as silent testimony to the violence inflicted upon her, while incriminating traces of physical evidence were uncovered upon her clothing, meticulously collected in the hopes of identifying her assailant. As the police meticulously combed through the residence in search of clues, another puzzling detail emerged. Despite thorough scrutiny, no signs of forced entry manifested at any of the entry points, doors and windows alike, prompting the unsettling realization that all entrances had been secured from within, shrouding the circumstances of Amanda's demise in further mystery. This revelation pointed the finger squarely at an inside perpetrator, leading detectives to scrutinize the inhabitants of the household. In conversation with Billy, detectives probed for insights into Amanda's demise. However, Billy's assertion that she might have perished due to accidental strangulation by her blanket diverged starkly from the forensic evidence uncovered at the scene. Sensing a need for deeper investigation, Detectives delved into Billy's background, unearthing a troubling history. Two years prior, both he and his wife had pleaded guilty to neglecting the proper care of their children. This damning detail served as the final puzzle piece for investigators. Coupled with Billy's seemingly detached response to his daughter's demise, his peculiar explanation of events and the absence of forced entry into the household, suspicions crystallized around him as the prime suspect in the unfolding tragedy. With resolve, the authorities promptly escorted Billy to the police station for intensified interrogation. In the ensuing days, detectives subjected Billy to relentless grilling, subjecting him to over 17 hours of intense interrogation spread across four days, Commencing on the day of the murder, November 29, 2001, Billy endured three and a half hours of questioning by detectives. By the conclusion of this initial session, investigators harbored little doubt regarding his culpability in the heinous crime. All that remained was to extract a confession from him. On that fateful first day, Billy adamantly maintained his innocence, vehemently denying any involvement in the tragic demise of his beloved daughter, Amanda. According to recorded transcripts of the interrogations, he reiterated his protestations over 650 times, underscoring his love for his children and his steadfast commitment to their well-being. Billy attributed his purported lack of awareness during the night of the murder to the deafening noise emitted by his sleep apnea machine, a claim met with skepticism by investigators. Undeterred, detectives persisted in their relentless pursuit of a confession, employing various tactics in their interrogation. They attempted to exploit Billy's religious convictions, suggesting divine retribution for his alleged misdeeds, and warned him of the impending incriminating evidence that would seal his fate. Despite their efforts, Billy remained resolute in his denial, prompting him to request a polygraph or lie detector test in a bid to vindicate himself. However, little did he know that this decision would mark the beginning of his unraveling. Shortly after commencing the polygraph examination, the examiner abruptly halted the proceedings, slamming his hand down on the table with a sense of finality. Locking eyes with Billy, he delivered the damning verdict. Billy had failed the test. Billy was shattered by the outcome. Confronted with the damning results of the polygraph, detectives intensified their scrutiny, urging Billy to confront the harrowing truth of his actions. Gradually, 
Billy's resolve waned, and he began to divulge the chilling details. Yet, his confession seemed tinged with uncertainty, as if he himself struggled to comprehend the depths of his transgression. The initial admission culminated in Billy signing a written statement, confessing to the unspeakable act of taking his own daughter's life. However, this confession would not mark the end of the grim revelations. By the conclusion of the fourth day of interrogation, Billy had provided a staggering total of four distinct confessions to the authorities. Yet, each narrative diverged markedly from the others, displaying a perplexing lack of consistency and coherence. In one iteration, he depicted Amanda's demise as the result of a beating with a broom, a detail absent from any other account. Moreover, discrepancies emerged regarding the inclusion or exclusion of a dream, with varying versions recounted across the different statements. The glaring disparities among the confessions rendered them incongruous with one another and failed to align with the evidence uncovered at the crime scene. Nonetheless, detectives chose to accept these confessions as truth, despite harboring suspicions of Billy's compromised mental state. Culminating this bewildering series of admissions was the fourth and final confession, a video reenactment, wherein Billy revisited the scene of the crime under police scrutiny, attempting to reconstruct the events of that fateful night. Despite his persistent protests of innocence, Billy found himself charged as the sole perpetrator in his daughter's murder, a consequence of his multiple conflicting confessions. However, following the grueling interrogations, Billy recanted all his admissions and vehemently asserted his innocence once more during court proceedings. Nevertheless, the die was cast, and Billy faced the stark reality of incarceration, denied any opportunity for bond or bail. With his conviction, it appeared that the case had reached a definitive conclusion. A year elapsed since the tragic murder, during which Billy's professed innocence persisted despite his earlier confession. Phil Beatty, a private attorney from Rock Hill, undertook the daunting task of defending Billy in court. Initially, Phil harbored doubts regarding Billy's innocence, a sentiment echoed by many who knew him. Consequently, his strategy revolved around securing the most favorable plea deal for Billy, with the aim of swiftly concluding the case and moving forward. However, after delving into the details of Billy's interrogation process in the immediate aftermath of the murder, Beatty was profoundly troubled by what he uncovered. Upon arrival at the police station, Billy's court-appointed public defender, B.J. Barrowclough, was unjustly denied access to the interrogation room to confer with his client, a blatant violation of Billy's rights. The authorities purportedly presented a note, purportedly signed by Billy, indicating his refusal to see his attorney at that time. When Barrowclaw contested this assertion, suggesting that Billy might have been coerced into signing, his pleas fell on deaf ears as the police adamantly refused to allow him to communicate directly with his client. It wasn't until after Billy's fourth confession that his defense attorney, B.J. Barrowclaw, was finally granted access to him. Upon questioning Billy about the circumstances surrounding his confession, Barrowclaw was astounded by Billy's revelation that the police had coerced him into signing the confession under the threat of facing the death penalty. Beatty was appalled by this blatant infringement of Billy's rights, recognizing the severity of the violation. However, he found himself uncertain about the potential impact of this information on Billy's case, given that the confessions had already been written and signed. In a startling development, Beatty received a call from the prosecutor's office in late 2002, summoning him for a meeting. Anticipating discussions regarding a potential deal for his client, he obliged, unaware of the bombshell awaiting him. As they convened, the prosecutors revealed that the DNA analysis conducted on Amanda's body had yielded an unexpected result. The DNA did not match Billy's. 
Beatty was struck with a mixture of shock and relief upon hearing this revelation, realizing that his client might indeed be innocent and that a genuine opportunity to vindicate him now existed. However, his astonishment transformed into seething indignation as the prosecutors disclosed a troubling fact. They had been aware of the DNA mismatch mere weeks after the murder, yet chose to withhold this crucial information for over a year. This egregious miscarriage of justice left Beatty incensed, unable to fathom how such a critical detail could be concealed from Billy's defense team for so long. Confronting the prosecutors, Beatty demanded an explanation for their belated disclosure, questioning why they had opted to reveal this information only now, after months of silence, despite being cognizant of the truth much earlier. And then, in a stunning revelation, the final piece of the puzzle fell into place. Beatty was informed that the reason for divulging this information at that moment was that the police had finally obtained a match to the DNA found on Amanda's body. The match belonged to a man named James Sanders. Little is known about James Sanders' background or his activities prior to 2001, except that he was a seasoned career criminal with a history of various offenses. Released from prison shortly before the tragic event, Sanders relocated to the same neighborhood as the Copes, settling just two blocks away from their residence. Despite their proximity, there is no evidence suggesting any prior acquaintance between Sanders and Billy Cope. Their starkly different backgrounds and lifestyles would have made them an unlikely pair. Billy, described by his lawyer as a socially isolated, devout Christian weighing 385 pounds and aspiring to preach, stood in stark contrast to Sanders, an African-American career criminal and drug addict. In the aftermath of Amanda's murder, Sanders embarked on a spree of violence, committing or attempting to commit four additional sexual assaults within the neighborhood over the course of six weeks. With the revelation of another individual's DNA found at the crime scene, Billy's attorneys came to the undeniable conclusion that he was factually innocent. Armed with this crucial information, they turned their focus to questioning Billy about why he had offered false confessions to the police during the initial interrogations following the murder. Billy recounted to his lawyers that during the police questioning in the immediate aftermath of the murder, he was steadfast in his innocence. However, he admitted to being in a state of shock and emotional turmoil following the traumatic loss of his daughter, which might have been misconstrued by the authorities as appearing emotionless. Furthermore, he disclosed that he had offered false confessions as a deliberate strategy to confound the police. Believing that his confessions would lack credibility without corroborating evidence, Billy sought to undermine their validity confident that the evidence would not substantiate any of his admissions. However, in a twist of events, Billy's assumptions were proven incorrect. Despite the glaring inconsistencies among his confessions and their discordance with the evidence found at the scene, the police were inexplicably willing to accept them as legitimate. This egregious oversight underscored the flawed handling of the case, further exacerbating the miscarriage of justice inflicted upon Billy. Despite the identification of Sanders as being present on the night of Amanda's tragic demise, Billy was nonetheless charged with the crime. The case proceeded to trial in 2004, with both sides endeavoring to establish the sequence of events that transpired on the fateful night of the murder. While Billy's defense team staunchly contended that he played no role in his daughter's tragic demise, prosecutors posited a simpler explanation that tied both Billy's confessions and the newfound DNA evidence together. They argued that the only plausible scenario was one in which both men, Billy and Sanders, were complicit in the crime, acting in concert to perpetrate the heinous act. According to the prosecution's narrative, Billy facilitated Sanders' entry into the home, explaining the absence of forced entry before re-securing the premises after the crime had been carried out. In response, 
Cope's attorneys vehemently refuted the prosecution's theory, asserting that it was a thinly veiled attempt to conceal the inadequacies of their interrogation methods. They contended that Billy, grappling with profound grief and potentially underlying mental health issues, had been vulnerable to manipulation by detectives, leading to false confessions extracted under duress. The defense also faced a setback when crucial evidence was barred from presentation to the jury by Judge John C. Hayes III, citing concerns of leading the jury into a logical fallacy. This excluded evidence pertained to the striking absence of forced entry in the four sexual assaults committed or attempted by Sanders in the weeks following Amanda's murder. The defense intended to highlight Sanders' modus operandi, demonstrating his expertise in breaking and entering while leaving behind no trace for even the most seasoned detectives to discern. However, Judge Hayes's ruling precluded the jury from considering this pertinent information, further complicating Billy's defense. Another critical piece of evidence withheld from the jury by Judge John C. Hayes III was the testimony from a jailhouse informant. This informant claimed to have overheard Sanders confess to raping and murdering a little girl in Rock Hill. While such testimonies are typically admitted by courts when advantageous to prosecutors, in this instance where it could have bolstered the defense's case, it was inexplicably excluded from consideration. Despite the apparent clarity surrounding Billy's innocence in his daughter's death, the jury arrived at a different conclusion. Both Sanders and Billy were convicted on charges of conspiracy, signifying that they allegedly collaborated to commit the crime. Subsequently, they each received life sentences without the possibility of parole in 2004. In April 2009, the verdict underwent an appeal process, leading to a significant development. A three-judge panel from the South Carolina Court of Appeals overturned the conspiracy conviction, citing a lack of evidence demonstrating any connection between Cope and Sanders. However, the South Carolina Attorney General swiftly appealed this decision, leading to its reversal. In 2013, the state Supreme Court upheld Cope's conviction, and despite efforts to seek justice, the U.S. Supreme Court declined to hear his case. Despite mounting evidence suggesting Billy's innocence, he remained incarcerated. Tragically, on February 9, 2017, at the age of 53, Billy Cope passed away from natural causes while in state custody. He never experienced freedom beyond the confines of a jail cell after being charged with the murder of his own daughter. Whether or not he was truly guilty remains a question for contemplation. And thus concludes the tragic narrative of Amanda Cope's murder and the subsequent harrowing ordeal endured by her father, Billy. As we reflect on this case, the question of Billy's innocence or guilt looms large. Was justice truly served for Amanda Cope? We invite you to share your thoughts and opinions on this heartbreaking saga in the comments below.